things are really starting to heat up here. More and more key indications and numbers that are even going beyond March and April. We're getting to the nonlinear portion of the deflationary recession, where the recession and the deflation are becoming more and more likely, but also more visible, more obvious, less ambiguous, less confusion. Now, before we get into what those indications are, we should take a step back first and talk about what I mean by non-linearity. Most of these recession crisis processes do not happen in straight line fashion, though many people's mental models suggest that they believe that it's easy one time straight line forward. In fact, we're given that mental model from economics where in their modeling using statistics, it's almost a straight line process. They don't model nonlinearity very well. An example of nonlinearity, the 2008 crisis, the Great Recession. Now, I think most people might remember it and understandable why they do, as it just showed up out of the blue in September and October 2008, that everything seemed to be okay up until that point when all the data and evidence showed that it was not okay, that under the surface, there were processes taking place that even though you couldn't see them or necessarily feel them in the real economy, they were happening all the time. So that when we got to September 2008, that was simply the nonlinear part of the recession process. The, re the recession process had been uh, underway the entire time. Most people might be surprised to learn that the markets had been warning about the 2008 crisis for several years before that. Again, nonlinearity. The euro dollar futures curve, for example, that one inverted a tiny little bit in September of 2006, two years before Lehman Brothers. And it was small and temporary and uninverted. And then it got more heavily inverted later on in November 2006. Even before that, the near-term forward spread, which is a later calculation, but the near-term forward spread, that one dipped negative in January 2006 and again in March before becoming more negative and more solidly negative in July 2006. But the first one, the first warning sign came all the way back December of 2005. The two-year, 10-year spread on the U.S. Treasury very briefly and very slightly turned inverted and negative December of 2005. So think about what that means. From December 2005 through 2006 into 2007, we got markets sending signals that everyone basically ignored, or you didn't know you needed to pay attention to them. Ben Bernanke, by the time he said subprime is contained, most people are like, what the hell do they mean by subprime? When markets had been saying for more than a year by then, hey, we're worried about something. And then from March of 2007, when Ben Bernanke said subprime was contained, all the way through the rest of the crisis period, the economy, even though you could see more and more was going wrong in the financial system, the economy itself seemed resilient and strong. In fact, they called it resilient and strong. They talked about it all the time. They forecast no recession in 2008, despite all of that mess in the financial system and subprime mortgages. It wasn't about subprime mortgages. All the markets were sending the warnings. And as far as people were concerned, they didn't see anything coming because we have this mental model of non-linearity, which is we start out with an economy that's doing fine. And we think that if it's going to hit a recession, it goes from doing fine to doing not fine in a straight line. It just gets a little slower and a little slower and a little slower and it's a little slower. And eventually it crosses some, re some recession threshold and it becomes a recession. So if, you're, if you start here and you start to get a little bit slower and a little bit slower and a little bit slower, you can just draw a straight line from where we started to how we're slowing down. And you can foresee if you just extrapolate in a straight line when the recession begins. But if, you're, if you think of that in, a, in linear terms, you think about the recession in linear terms, and then the recession doesn't begin when you have it penciled in and scheduled, what that suggests is essentially the economy seems to be doing fine. So you get the initial slowdown and then it doesn't slow down and slow down and slow down in straight line fashion. What happens in reality is the economy sort of hovers for quite a while there. Instead of going in straight line fashion from slow down or economic growth to slow down into recession, you get the slow down and then you get basically nothing 
for a variable period of time. And during that variable period of time, as people in their mental map, in their mental maps think in linear terms, they're thinking the recession isn't happening, therefore it can't happen. When all the time we get warnings from the marketplace saying the recession is happening, you just can't see it because we haven't gotten to the part that's most visible. So the economy slows down, it hovers for quite a period of time. This was definitely the case in 2007, even into 2008. And then it's seemingly all of a sudden the recession and the real part of the crisis hit. But it wasn't all of a sudden, it just doesn't happen in a straight line. It happens a little bit and then things start to, to adjust. It, it, it comes on in increments and then it happens a little more and then it seems like everything adjusts. Think about how the economy has evolved over the last couple of years, where we have seen a lot of financial indications suggesting that something is very wrong here. The economy slowed way down really back into the early part of 2022. Remember the technical recession? That was the economy transitioning from its 2021 artificial growth state into where we are today. But then over the last year and a half almost, it appears as if the economy has been strong and resilient in the face of all of these massive headwinds. When in fact, the economy is not strong and resilient. The markets are telling us that we're in that phase after the initial slowdown where it seems to be hovering along just fine and eventually it gets to that part where it stops hovering along just fine and goes like that, just like in 2008. Non-linearity. We don't start here and go in a straight line to recession. We start here and we go back and forth all over the place until eventually we get to that part where everyone says, oh, it was a recession all along. That's the indications that we're getting here. And just to put an just to emphasize my point here, we got the first inversion in December of 2005. The, the part of the crisis that everyone recognizes as the crisis and the recession, that was later in 2008. So you're talking almost three years into it. The final net layoffs, the final negative jobs report wouldn't come about until the middle of 2010. So you're talking more than four years, almost five years from beginning to actual end. And throughout that period, we got the strong, resilient economy, we got all sorts of financial indications. We got a huge mess where it wasn't so easy to say, we started here and we could just end up here and everybody could see it coming the entire way. Nonlinearity is how everything progresses here, markets as well as economy. As I mentioned in the introduction, we've got lots of indications which suggest that we're getting to the nonlinear portion of the deflationary recession, both in terms of the recession as well as the deflation potential. And deflation potential is not just the opposite of inflation or not just negative consumer prices, the opposite of positive consumer price pressures. Deflationary potential is the interruption of money and credit, the flow of money and credit through the global economy, which produces the most harmful results. I talk about yesterday, the dramatic trading in forward rate markets, as well as cash bond markets or rate markets, global bond markets, yields falling all over the place. A bit of fear and panic in forward rate markets, consistent with everything here. Let's talk about a couple other indications. One in particular, actually there's two in particular, but let's start out with one that's short term, the short term part of the yield curve, because that's a key indication of timing and nonlinearity. You think back to March and April, treasury bills. We had the big downdraft in treasury bills when Silicon Valley was announced, Silicon Valley Bank's failure was announced. That was March 10th and March 9th, 10th and moving forward. Essentially, bill yields plunged, even the three-month bill yield, bill yield plunged. But after March 17th, short-term rates outside of the four-week and eight-week, which were heavily bid for collateral purposes, the three-month bill yield started to go back to where it was normally. In fact, that was true of most of the bills uh, from March, middle part of March on to the rest of the cycle to thus far. What's different about bill yields this time is that they've been moving solidly lower since the middle part of October, unlike April and March earlier this year. The bills are starting to go down in yield as more and more financial participants are saying, you know, 
I really like these bill, bill yields here at above 5%. I'd like to lock some of these in, like these lock these returns in, because I don't like the, the risks out there in the real economy in the financial marketplace. So if I can get 5.3, 5.4, maybe 5.5% in a bill, I'd like to go as far as I can because if if stuff keeps happening in non-linear fashion, like the markets keep pro projecting, rates are not gonna be 5% down the road. So I'm gonna start buying some treasury bills, as many as I possibly can, to lock in those juicy returns to wait out whatever actually happens. So as bill yields go lower, that tells us that more and more participants in the marketplace are thinking along those lines. They're saying, I'm gonna lock in these nice safe returns in treasury bills while I can. Even if bill yields are a little bit lower than they were last week, I'm gonna do it because I'm more convinced today that some bad stuff's gonna happen that drives rates even lower in the future. So unlike March and April, Lots of bills are starting to go low, including the three-month bill. I've talked about the 52-week bill before, but the three-month bill, that one's going lower. That's a key indication. Think about what that means. You want to lock in your return for three months ahead, and you and everyone else is doing the same thing at the same time. There is a quite a bit of angst, uncertainty in these lower bill yields. Now, where there is a measure of outright fear in hedging, that's interest rate swap spreads. Something I've been talking about since April, since, since April. Something I've been talking about since August, when swap spreads really started to send some very serious signals, really going back to July, but August and into September and October. While everyone was, was paying attention to the long end of the yield curve and the sell-off, interest rate swap spreads were saying, that sell-off isn't gonna last. Once we come out of the September effect, the fundamentals are increasingly negative. Demand for hedging was going way up. The ability to supply that hedging, the ability to take on risk among dealers, that was going way down. That's a negative swap spread. Essentially, swap spreads have been saying throughout September and really October and November, things are heating up. We're getting closer and closer to the non-linear stuff in the economy and the financial system. And what you see is the swap spreads the 30 year has been basically stuck at the same level since the last September plunge. So that one, not a whole lot of information in there, except that in the bigger picture term of this cycle, or the end of this supply shock cycle, the 30 year swap spread has told us nothing really changed. We weren't getting into inflation. We weren't coming out of the banking crisis any better off than we went into it. The 30 year swap spread said everything is just the way it was as we fell off in uh, late, late in 2022. The 10 year spread, the 10 year spread is down substantially since August 28. In fact, it really plunged August 28 of this year, just to be specific. And last week on Thursday, we got a record low swap spread, negative swap spread for SOFR, and it was nearly matched yesterday. So swap spreads are sinking even lower in November. Now we can make some comparisons because the SOFR spreads haven't been around all that long. We had LIBOR, Eurodollar futures, which were based on LIBOR for a long period of time. And we can make some rough comparisons because they do line up over the couple of years where they overlapped. But essentially look at where the 10 year SOFR based interest rate swap spread is today. It's like March 17th of 2020 or August, September, 2019. Remember the repo problems there? November, 2015 and 2016, the massive amounts of global financial problems across the world in Euro dollar number three. The swap spread where it is today is, it isn't unprecedented, but it's in the same negative territory where it has been during some of the worst circumstances of the last 15 years. The five-year swap spread, that is gone a lot lower than it had been in March and April. That's another one suggesting things are really heating up here. Back in March and April with the LIBOR-based Eurodollar future spreads, you had some individual days or a couple periods of days where you saw spreads get a little bit lower. But on the whole, the five-year SOFR swap spread, that one is going substantially lower too. And the comparisons there are the same as you see in the 10-year. Swap spreads are also an indication of this non-linearity that I've been talking about. Back in 2008, what we saw was swap spreads behaved in their 
pre-crisis, well-behaved hierarchy where you saw the 30-year spread on the top, the 10-year in the middle, and the five-year on, on the bottom. Essentially, they moved in a very narrow uh, range where that was good hierarchy. That's how interest rate, swap spread, interest rate swaps and interest rate swap spreads are supposed to work. August 9th of 2007, just blasted everything apart. The entire market, you could see the, you could see the financial system have incredible trouble trying to navigate the circumstances that showed up in August 9th, 2007, to the point that the, the entire interest rate swap spread hierarchy just shatters. And it's never gone back since then. So that was an indication in August of 2007 for non-linearity in the financial system. But in the overall economy, while swap spreads were going haywire, the overall economy seemed to be doing just fine. Because again, how does an interest rate swap spread pertain to jobs in, say, the retail sector? It doesn't go from one place to the other in a direct straight line fashion in a short period of time. It takes time for these things to work through. For financial and monetary irregularities to become economic problems, it takes time and it doesn't happen all at once. So we got this major major warning in August of 2007, the economy seemed fine. And then the big downturn in spreads, swap spreads that started in August of 2008, even before we got to Lehman Brothers and really the big part of the, the recession. But swap spreads were turning more negative as those layoffs in the non-linear part of the recession actually developed in 2008 as well. So swap spreads turned more negative, August, September, and then the big turn in October 2008, which was non-linear part of the Great Recession, non-linear part of the global monetary, not financial, monetary crisis of 2008. It doesn't happen in a straight line fashion. It happens in chunks and increments, it back and forth, ebbs and flows. Nothing ever goes in a straight line. There is also nonlinearity in the macro economy where it pertains to the labor market, which we'll talk about in a future video. We've got the, we've got the November payroll report for the United States coming up this week, which will give us an opportunity to revisit this, the employment situation in the U.S. Again, that's nonlinear too. It seems like the labor market slows down and then all of a sudden it doesn't slow down anymore. It just falls apart. We're getting more indications from some of the economic statistics related to the labor market that suggest the economy, like the marketplace, like the financial system, like the monetary system, is moving closer and closer to that nonlinear piece of the deflationary recession. So, for the last couple of videos, yesterday and then again today, signs of non-linearity in the marketplace. We've got bond yields that are falling tremendously. Just look at the European yields right now. European forward rates and U.S. dollar forwards, forward rate markets, those suggesting things are really heating up here. Demand for hedging has really accelerated, which is not a good sign as, uh, for of anything. We've got short-term treasury bill rates that are moving in a way that they didn't move outside of a couple weeks in uh, the, part, the middle part of March there. More steady over the last couple months here, almost a couple months in bills, which suggests the market is increasingly confident, unlike back in March and April, that this is the nonlinear part of the deflationary recession. And a big one that we always watch, interest rate swaps and interest rate swap spreads which are shouting, shouting that something big is happening. It's related to hedging. It's related to collateral. It's related to dealer capacity to absorb risk in the system, risk aversion. Something big is happening here, which suggests the nonlinear part of the deflationary recession. The what are interest rate swaps and interest rate swap spreads and why are they so important? Well, that's in the video link below me. I highly recommend you check that one out. As always, I thank you very much for joining me. Huge thank you, Eurodollar University members, Eurodollar University subscribers. And until next time, take care.